This is the Power Macintosh 6100 DOS compatible, a slightly less common derivative of the plain 6100. The idea behind this model was for Apple to offer a system that had the best of both worlds. It was a PC and a Mac. How could you decline this offer? You got the best of both. You could run your Windows software, your DOS software, and your Macintosh software at full speed with no penalty. This was provided by the rather clever Houdini 2 expansion card, which occupies the only free slot. Houdini 2 is basically an entire PC on a card, with some Apple custom ASICs to bridge it into the uh, Power Macintosh's bus. So let's open it up and take a look inside, because the outside of the case is fairly boring, although it is a pizza box, much typical of Apple and Sun systems of the time. Before we dive into the internals of the machine, let's just take a look at the back. It was made in 1995, March 28th, in the Colorado Apple factory. Standard Apple Ethernet, SCSI, that weird HDI 45 connector, which has many pins, but in the case of the Medusa cable, not that many. This has ADB, sound in and out, video, all kinds of stuff on that connector, only used for the new bus power mix. Then you have serial, ADB, sound in and out, reset, and the wonderful Medusa dongle that was required for the PC card. So what the heck is this cable? It's a breakout cable. Out of here is coming video and uh, game port. So it has a sound blaster and you get a game port, which is fantastic. Then the Medusa cable branches out, goes around into this connector, which is like a standard Macintosh monitor connector that would plug into your Nubus video card if you had one. But in this case, we don't have one because we only have one slot. So HDI 45 adapter dongle into this dongle. And then I have another dongle on the end of that to adapt it to VGA. So yeah, Apple has liked dongles for a very long time. And this is not a new thing. People complain about the MacBook Pros. Well, I'd like to have all these thick cables dangling off of your laptop. I mean, this is, it makes it difficult to put the Mac against the wall because you need all this clearance for this thick cable. And then of course you have your monitor cable plug in here. The inside of these machines is fairly cramped. I actually restored this system in March of this year on its birthday. It got brand new capacitors, which I soldered on myself. I replaced the CPU cooler. I put heat sinks on various ASICs so it could run a bit cooler. These run really hot just because the thermals are just bad. You have a really hot 486 sitting directly over a really hot PowerPC 601 and there's just not enough fans. So I'll show a modification I did to try to improve that. This is the OEM Apple 500 meg SCSI hard drive that was made by IBM. It's actually a pretty quiet drive. Sound is carried to and from the PC card via these two cables. That way you can use your internal Mac speaker for PC sound and the CD-ROM sound is carried through to the PC card as well. This one cable runs to the CD-ROM, this one goes to the logic board. Now with some cables out of the way, you can easily see more of the logic board. The heat sinks I put on the ASICs to keep them cool actually did make quite a bit of a difference in the stability of the machine. And now with the PC card removed, you can see the rest of the logic board. More ASICs, more new caps. There's the PowerPC 601 CPU, to the right of that is the ROM SIM and the cache SIM, the level 2 cache. I do believe that's a 256K level 2 cache. So I do not remember off the top of my head what each of these chips did. I'm pretty sure that these two are the bus and memory controllers, given their proximity to the cache and the CPU. I might be wrong, I don't have the system block diagram in front of me right now. Underneath the hard drive is my cooling mod. It's going to be difficult to see. There is a black rectangle there over that vent. That's actually a PCI slot blower I removed the bracket off of. Draws in cool air and blows it directly over the PowerPC chip. Then it gets sucked across the motherboard into the power supply. This dramatically improved cooling on this system, where before it would generally overheat with the PC card. Now it runs perfectly fine. Here's the star of the show the Apple PC Compatibility Card 2, a.k.a. Houdini 2. And this is actually an 040 PDS card. 
and that adapter there electrically converts it to the VDS slot of the PowerPC Nubus Macintoshes. There's quite a bit in common between the Nubus Power Macintoshes and the late Nubus Quadras, and I have a feeling that is why this works the way it does with such little amounts of conversion circuitry on the adapter board. You could take this board and stick it in a Quadra 950 without that bracket and it would work just fine. Which leads me to believe that the PDS or VDS of the Nubus Power Macintoshes is somewhat compatible with that of the 040 PDS. So here's the card. Underneath that little heatsink is the 66 MHz 486 from Intel, the DX2. Got a chips and technologies system chipset and video controller which is poking out from underneath that green daughter board. That's our Sound Blaster daughter board, which was actually an option. Apple did not include that by default on all configurations. The VLSI chip there is an Apple Custom Silicon that serves as the bridge between the PC and the Macintosh. The ROM BIOS has the copyright Apple sticker on top of it. Not sure what that Intel chip does there. The jumper sets it if it's a DX or an SX. We have a SIM slot with 16 megs RAM. Supposedly this could take up to 32 or 64 megabytes, but I couldn't get it to boot with a 32 meg stick. It can also run without its own RAM. The Apple Bridge chip will actually share the Macintosh host RAM with the PC. You can say I want to share 32 megs of my Macintosh's RAM with the PC, and it'll do that. Just like the Sun PC card I covered for the SBus Spark stations. Very similar concept. However, due to the single tasking nature of the Macintosh operating system, you get a pretty horrendous performance penalty uh, whenever you share the host memory with the PC card. That's why I installed the 16 meg stick on the PC card. Uh, but it is kind of interesting how dense it is. You, you know, got a whole 486 PC on this rather short card with custom circuitry to make it talk to a PowerPC Macintosh. Kind of neat. And so here we are booted into the Power Mac, and this is the PC setup control panel. This is where you set up everything about your PC that's inside your Mac. You can have up to two virtual hard disk files, you can share folders and drives with the PC, you can share serial ports, you can turn on and off the sound, and if you don't have a SIM inserted, you can specify how much of the host memory is taken up by the PC. So let's switch to the PC. I already booted it up and started up Windows 3.11 for work groups. And here you have Mod for Win, the mod file player for 16 and 32-bit Windows. This is the sound from the Sound Blaster Vibra 16. And you can, of course, multitask. We're back on the Mac. We have Photoshop open.
that was pretty neat, wasn't it? You can switch back and forth between the systems, they work independently, and the performance is quite good. I think now is a good time to show general application usage and uh, how MIDI sounds on this machine. So let's switch to the CD where I have a bunch of MIDIs. Passport.mid's good. As you can see, you can effortlessly move things between the systems, and everything runs great. Now it's time for some game tests. Run 
runs pretty smoothly. This is Descent 2, a game that pushes the limits of the 66 MHz 486. say this is a very impressive solution Apple came up with two computers in one compact box I mean, it's fantastic I'm surprised it didn't sell more than it did a fun random fact uh, PC users who bought these literally thought that the power button was a floppy eject button and uh, they would turn off their system trying to eject the disk they didn't realize that these Macs have uh, motorized eject so yeah that's about it for the Apple PC compatibility card. <laughs>